Thank you for the invitation. I'm extremely happy to be able to present you my research today. Uh, as Tilman was saying, my main field of expertise is functional data analysis. Uh, nevertheless, uh, today we'll stick more with uh, more typical uh, spatial data analysis application. Uh, the talk is very informal, um, and uh, I uh, decided to try to give you an idea of the overall line of research with its many uh, direction, uh, rather than get into the technical details of any of these uh, methods. But of course, feel free to interrupt and ask. I'm very happy to uh, give more details. Uh, so these are physics info methods for spatial and for functional data analysis, as you will see, uh, observed over possibly non-Euclidean domains. And in particular, we are interested in some non-standard form of spatial and functional data uh, that display non-Euclidean variation. And this non-Euclidean variation may be induced by the complex physics of the underlying phenomenon. And in particular, my um, research has been driven by application in the life sciences, uh, uh, in large uh, scientific endeavor, for instance, modeling concerning the modeling of blood flow within carotid arteries affected by either stenosis or aneurysm. Um, the non-Euclidean variation may also uh, result from the presence of some external driving forces that may induce a strong anisotropies and non-stationarity in the observed phenomena. Or else they may result from the complex physics, uh, complex geometry of the domain on the top of which we observe the data that we would like to analyze. A uh, domain that can be characterized by non Euclidean features such as sharp concavity, certain holes, or a folded geometry. So, for instance, on the bottom right picture, you see some neuroimaging uh, signal associated with neural activity in the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is a very thin layer of neural tissue which constitutes the outermost part of our brain is where most of the neural activity uh, arises. And it has a highly folded uh, geometry. In fact, you can represent it by a two-dimensional remaining manifold on the top of which you observed the data that you would like to analyze. And because of this highly folded uh, uh, geometry, you have data that you observe in locations that are very close by in Euclidean distance, but far apart on the real uh, geometry of the domain. On the top is uh, uh, another application where instead we were studying uh, stresses and forces exerted by blood flow over the wall of a carotid artery. So here the domain is the quasi-tubular two-dimensional domain of the arterial wall. And what we analyze on the top of it is a uh, uh, stress such as the Walsh stress, the modulus of Walsh stress, exerted by blood flow over the arterial wall. Here instead is an application in an engineering problem uh, in a project where we were optimizing the shape of the winglet of a shuttle. A shuttle, uh, uh, was a, this was a collaboration with uh, S3 Swiss Space System Holding. So um, this uh, shuttle was later sent to space. These are small shuttles that bring small satellites into space. And then we were analyzing the pressure exerted by air on the winglet of the shuttle. Again, the domain can be a uh, three-dimensional non-convex uh, domain uh, with fascinating application in the neurosciences, uh, studying uh, neuroimaging signal in the gray matter. The gray matter is a volume with a very complicated shape uh, characterized by the Sulci and Giri of, the, of our brain. And uh, more recently, we are also moving uh, to linear networks domain. So the domain where the data are observed is a linear network, such as a road network or a river network. The uh, models that we have by far developed uh, are for spatial and for functional data analysis. For spatial data analysis, we have, for instance, space-time, non-parametric and semi-parametric regression. We have generalized linear regression, non-parametric density or intensity estimation, intensity estimation of these homogeneous Poisson processes, I mean. We have space-time quantile regression, mixed effect formulation. And for functional data analysis, we have uh, models such as uh, functional principal component analysis, functional partially square, functional regression, again, mixed effect formulation, functional depth measures. Uh, all the estimation problem, they are physics informs as they rely, I mean, they uh, feature regular Vazian term that involves partial differential equation encoding the available problem specific information about the phenomenon in the study. And these PDEs, they are defined on the top of the domain where we observe the data. 
The estimation problem do not possess, do not enjoy any closed form solution. So we have to resort to numerical analysis, uh, for instance, finite element analysis or isogeometric analysis based on, uh, for instance, non-uniform rational displines, which are particularly convenient for engineering application. Everything is implemented in uh, an R C++ library uh, named FDA PDE that can be downloaded from CRAN. And the library has been developed with a specific attention to computational sustainability and computational efficiency, also in the context of a uh, um, massive data set. So uh, it employs um, state-of-the-art approaches of numerical linear algebra, stochastic approximations, stochastic optimization, and so on. Now, let me give the credits to the many people that I was able to involve over this line of research across the year. On the left, I clustered the former students, Eleonora Arnone, Laura Zimonti, Mara, Etin, Mara Bernardi, Bri Ettinger, Federico Ferraccioli, Ardi Lila, Matteo Wilhelm, and Matteo Tomasetto. They are all scattered uh, around the globe now. In the central column is a numerical analyst, expert in the discretization of partial differential equation problem. Luca Formaggia, Luca De Fabio Nobile, who is currently at APFL, and Simona Perotto. On the right is uh, colleagues in statistics or international collaboration, uh, international collaborators. So from my own institution is Pier Cesare Secchi. And then from other institutions is uh, John Aston, Jim Ramsey, Livio Finos, Alois Knight. I will introduce you the, the estimation problem in the simplest possible formulation. So D will be the domain over which we observe the data. This is a two dimensional, three dimensional domain. Um, and this can be non-convex, so it includes remaining manifold, non-convex volumes, linear networks, and so on. And at location PI, scattered over T, we observe a variable of interest and possibly also a set of covariates. And we model the mean of the response conditionally on the covariates and location through a possibly non-linear link function, uh, considering a semi-parametric model that features a regression on the covariates plus a regression on a non-parametric term that is a field over the domain D. And to estimate beta in half, so beta the vector of regression coefficient, which indicates the relationship between the covariates and the response, and the non-parametric term that instead captures the spatial and spatial temporal variation of the phenomenon, we minimize a penalized loss function. And now the loss depends on the statistical model that is most appropriate for the problem at end. So this can be a regression term, a maximum Lapierre term, it can be quantile regression term, it might be a rank one approximation to a principal component analysis problem or to a partial least per problem and so on. The regularizing term instead is the L2 norm over the domain D of the misfit of a PDE that encodes the available problem specific information. And this may come from the physics, chemistry, morphology of the problem at end. Uh, the lambda parameter um, instead uh, is a so-called smoothing parameter, and it balances uh, the uh, fidelity to the data uh, and the fidelity to the physical model. So I love this estimation problem because they bind together in this happy marriage two of the most versatile uh, framework we have uh, from statistics and from mathematics. So the empirical model from statistics uh, either the regression maximum likelihood uh, uh, framework uh, and the physical model, the PDEs, which are the most uh, powerful mathematical tool to, comp to model complex phenomena behavior. And um, together they give rise to this uh, um, fascinating estimation problem, um, highly challenging from the theoretical point of view and extremely powerful in terms of modeling. Um, of course, data could be observed over space and time. So I could have spatial temporal location PITJ at which I observe a variable of interest and also covariates. And then the model is exactly as before, but now the field is defined over the spatial temporal domain and the regularizing term may involve a time dependent PDE or else you may use two regularizing terms that uh, separately uh, regularize the field in space and time. But this does not imply anything about separability in space and time. Uh, I mean, it does not imply the usual separability that you have in uh, partial temporal statistics. Uh, within this framework, you can uh, easily handle missing data 
uh, also characterized by complex missing data patterns and severe missing data patterns. And of course, you can handle uh, uh, various sampling design. So instead of having just statistical data, you might have data observed over area subdomains in space or interval and or interval subdomain in time. Uh, so let me discuss briefly the key uh, uh, ingredients of this estimation problem. So as I said, the loss and the link, they determine the statistical model you are considering. So for instance, if you use the canonical link function and you use for loss the negative associated negative log likelihood, then you are in the framework of generalized uh, linear semi-parametric or non-parametric regression. And uh, so you can model any response in the exponential family. You can even replace the mean by the alpha quantile, and the loss in this case would be the pinball loss or the quantile check function, in which case you can model space-time quantile regression that can be either fully non-parametric or semi-parametric, depending on presence or absence of covariates. Now, let me point that the um, uh, non-trivial forms of the domain D, which we are considering, and the non-trivial forms of the regularizing term, which involves PDEs defined upon these uh, non-trivial domains, they raise uh, challenging analytical issues. Uh, when studying, for instance, the well-posedness of this estimation problem or the asymptotic properties of the estimators. Uh, nevertheless, we have been uh, able uh, so far to implement uh, and uh, study the asymptotics for um, linear, second-order, elliptic, and parabolic PDEs with space-varying coefficient. And let me point out that the mathematical formulation is not restricted to any form of PDE. So as long as the PDE is such that the estimation problem is well posed, then it can be considered within this mathematical framework. For the moment, I said uh, we um, studied the theory and implemented the method in the case of linear, second-order, elliptic, and parabolic PDEs with space very coefficient. This an already enables quite a um, large flexibility in the modeling of space variation, because by the second order term, the diffusion term, we may model a non-stationary anisotropic diffusion, whose direction and intensity may vary over space. By the transport term, uh, we may model uh, non-stationary uh, one directional effects, again, whose direction and intensity may vary over space. A reaction enables to model shrinkage towards the null solution, towards the null filter, again, non-stationary. Forcing uh, term uh, um, offers further degrees of freedom in the modeling because these are used to model source effects. So for instance, if you're modeling wildfire, wildfire propagation, you might use the forcing term to model the presence, the spatial presence of fuel or inflammable material over the domain. Now, just to fix idea, an illustrative, uh, naive application to data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is measurement of sea surface temperature at neural uh, uh, buoys uh, around the Florida Peninsula. So the, the buoys carry, so, uh, carry devices that take measurement of oceanographic quantities. Now, of course, we have a prior knowledge here that is the presence of the Gulf Stream and the Gulf Stream can be modeled through a diffusion of action uh, model that can be incorporated into the statistical uh, estimation problem so that the estimator will know that the values of the temperature observed in two locations that are in the direction of the stream, they are more strongly associated that uh, the values observed in two locations that are instead in transversal direction with respect to the stream. So in fact, if we use the data observed at voice, with the problem-specific information, we can have an estimate of the sea surface temperatures are like this one. And uh, this is a remarkably good estimate. And I can tell you this because if we compare with sea, uh, with sea surface uh, temperature satellite measurement, which we are not using here for, to derive the estimate, you can see that these strongly anisotropic and non-stationary features, which we were getting in the estimate, just by using this few location, they are truly present in the phenomenon and the study, okay? And this is because we were able to leverage on the problem-specific information. If we were not to use this, then we would obtain an estimate such as this one. So here I'm just using a simple isotropic and stationary regularization. 
and none of these features can be obtained. And in fact, uh, I mean, if you look at the cross-validation error, um, so the error at the voice in cross-validation, you can see that uh, including the information about the stream uh, improves uh, uh, with respect to uh, the uh, standard isotropic and stationary uh, fit. And in fact, uh, it also uh, leads to better estimates than those that you would obtain by creating either isotropic or anisotropic or by the SPD approach. Now, of course, here the PDE may depend upon some other parameters that may be unknown, but you can estimate them from uh, the data themselves uh, through profiling estimation. And this ability of the method to estimate the parameters of the PDE directly from the data is particularly convenient because it enables you to estimate the anisotropy from the data, even in absence of any problem-specific information. So for instance, let me consider another naive application to the Switzerland rainfall measurement data. This is a famous benchmark used in spatial interpolation. So these are the rainfall measurement in Switzerland in the 8th of May of 1986. And you can see that they are characterized by a strongly anisotropic pattern. And uh, this anisotropic pattern cannot be explained by elevation or other covariates, but we can estimate it from the data themselves by letting a diffusion term with unknown direction and intensity. And if we do, we, uh, we estimate these uh, anisotropic ellipses. And again, you can improve uh, in terms of cross-validation error with respect to the fit that you would do with an isotropic model. And in fact, if we knew about the wind, we, we might wonder, of course, that rainfall was accompanied by wind. If we knew about the wind, we could have included it in our uh, model. We don't. We couldn't find any record of the wind on the 8th of May of 1986. But of course, we can try to attempt to estimate it from the data. So I can add here a transport term uh, with an unknown direction and intensity. And uh, I will estimate it. And this is the wind that I estimate from the data. And again, in terms of cross-validation error, you can improve your estimate. And uh, if you look at the Switzerland uh, uh, wind rows, this is one of the prevailing wind in Switzerland. Now, again, if you compare to um, other mainstream approaches, uh, special data analysis, uh, you would unable to obtain uh, uh, these good estimates. Now, in absence of any problem specific information and in absence of any apparent anisotropy in the data, what you would do is to consider a simple isotropic uh, regularization with the Laplace or Laplace Beltrami operator. But since this operator is defined upon the domain D, this means that naturally we are computing distances which are not across concavities of the domain, but they are within the domain. So naturally we are considering a matrix which complies with the geometry of the domain rather than using the Euclidean matrix. So to wrap up the idea of, I mean, of modeling the spatial variation or space-time variation by the regularizing term, enable us to do it in a way that is directly suggested by the physics of the phenomenon. Whenever we have some partial, limited, imperfect uh, knowledge about the phenomenon and the study, and it also enable us to do it in a way that is compliant uh, with the geometry of the domain, which is crucial when the domain has a uh, geometry that influences the phenomenon and the study. Now, the type of application I normally work with uh, are application in the life sciences, uh, in large scientific endeavors, uh, gathering uh, researchers from very diverse fields, uh, statistics, numerical analysis, computer sciences, uh, medical doctor, of course. And in all these uh, uh, projects, we have been able to um, display the potentialities of these uh, new methods. Uh, and this not only in terms of advancement of our still uh, limited knowledge about this pathology, but also in terms of uh, uh, real practical implication. So for instance, in the mathematics for carotid anderectomy project that was devoted to uh, the study of atherosclerosis, we have been able through uh, our techniques to ascertain the quality of different stent 
uh, geometries. So stents are those little nets that get inserted in the uh, in the artery to uh, remove the stenosis. And uh, so we have been able to ascertain what type of stent is our appropriate is most appropriate for the specific subject with the specific morphology of the subject and the specific hemodynamical regime of the subject. And uh, um, in this project, we have been able to develop algorithms that in a not so far away future of personalized medicine, they could be built in, in the machine that take the scanner and help the medical doctor, support the medical doctor in deciding what type of intervention to take for the specific subject. So this is something that made the, the medical doctor truly amazingly enthusiastic. Um, nevertheless, today I will stick with more uh, typical spatial data analysis application. I have to say, I excuse myself, but in terms of application in more typical um, uh, spatial data analysis settings, uh, my application is are way more naive. Nevertheless, I picked up one which I like because it shows the potentialities of the method. And this is an application again in a large project, which was named Green Move Project. And this was a project devoted to the, the development of a uh, system of sharing of small electrical uh, um, vehicles. Okay. And we were studying mobile traffic data. We were studying the mobile traffic data with the idea of uh, looking at the and uh, exploring the dynamics of the population during the day. So uh, these are the data. So this is the heartbeat of Milano. It's not the heartbeat of a patient, but the heartbeat of Milano. So this is night and this is day. And the highest peak is uh, Central Station. Uh, second highest peak is the Duomo Cathedral uh, Spare. Uh, so here, for those of you who ever flew to Linate Airport, is uh, Linate Airport. Here is the exposition pavilion, and it shows up at night because they were working on an exposition on an exposition that would have taken place in the following two weeks. And as you can see, you can very well see the roads around Milano and going down to to Genova, to Rome, going east to Venice, because people, of course, they speak as they drive. They shouldn't, but they do. Uh, so the the problem is that in the end, this data. They are strongly characterized, very strongly characterized by these uh, sharp uh, uh, anisotropies along the road. So the idea that we explored is, can we use the PDE to inform the estimator about the topology of the domain, so the texture of the domain? So we started from the main road network and derived directly from the shape files of the main road network an anisotropic uh, tensor that would uh, the uh, estimator know that people would likely move more quickly along highways rather than in the countryside. And by doing this, we have been able to uh, analyze this data. These are massive data with uh, billions of entries in a way to respect the strong anisotropy in the data uh, in achieving estimates that were far superior with those that we had obtained with uh, more classical methods. So I apologize for an instance. The problem of young kids <laughs> is that you go from one cold to another cold. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, just a little idea of the estimator. Uh, I will stick with linear regression just because it's the easier to, to explain in terms of uh, formulas. So I have a least square, penalized least square problem. Of course, the problem is uh, uh, well posed uh, in an appropriate space of function, which for the type of PDEs that we are considering so far is a Sobolev uh, H2 space, uh, a function with a boundary condition. And in terms of boundary condition, you can use the classical uh, boundary condition of a elliptical problem that is uh, Dirichlet, Neumann, uh, Robin, or Mix, depending on the problem at hand. Um, I will package into X the covariates. So uh, X will be the design matrix for the parametric part of the mobile model. H is the usual head matrix in uh, regression, and Q instead project into the orthogonal complement. Then you can prove that the estimator uh, beta hat and half hat um, exist and they are uniquely defined. So the estimation problem is well posed. Mm -hmm. And the beta hat, in fact, is a very simple least square estimator. F hat satisfies this variational problem. 
And this variational problem does not possess a closed form solution. Uh, now, moreover, because of the non-trivial form of the domain D that we consider, and because of the non-trivial form of the horizon term, we were not able to uh, leverage on the argument that were used, for instance, by David Cox to prove uh, consistency of more classical non-parametric uh, regression uh, models. Nevertheless, with uh, Eleonora Arnone, uh, Fabio Nobile, Alois Knight, we were able to prove many years ago a paper that finally was published last year in Statistical Silica. Uh, and um, we were able to investigate the uh, rates of convergence of the bias and variance of the estimator uh, in different functional norms. And thus we were able to prove the consistency of the estimator Although, I mean, the estimator, they are not available in closed form solution, as I said. We don't possess the green uh, function of the uh, differential operator in the regularizing term. And thanks to this rate, we were also able to prove that the estimator achieves uh, the optimal rate of convergence for a um, non-parametric estimator, which uh, the, the rate, of course, depends on the uh, regularity of the true unknown field. So depending on the regularity, you get a rate. And this was a proof, a very strong proof of optimality of this method. And then, of course, to compute the estimator, you have to discretize the problem. And we do it either by mixed effect, uh, uh, mixed uh, finite element formulation, or by isogeometric analysis. This last uh, approach is uh, more suitable for engineering application because it leverages on um, uh, extension of splines such as NURBS, which are used in CAD in computer aided design. Uh, no matter what discretization you like, in the end, you can prove that also the discrete counterpart of the estimation problem is well posed. And the estimator, in fact, they have a very simple form. So we already commented upon the fact that the beta hat is a least square estimator, but also the half hat has a very simple form because the half hat, so my mm -hmm. estimate for the field will be described as a basis expansion in the basis we are considering, either finite element or NURBS. And the vector of coefficient has this very simple form where this matrix C is the design matrix corresponding to the non-parametric part of the model. So this matrix is, uh, packages the basis evaluated at the end of the allocation. So in the end, you have very simple estimator, least square and penalized least square estimator, and because of this, you can also leverage this on uh, uh, decades of literature uh, in a non-parametric regression concerning, for instance, inference for this estimator. Um, now, also for the discrete estimator, we uh, were able to uh, characterize the rate of convergence of the bias and variance, and we were able to prove the consistency of the estimator and that their mean square error achieves the optimal rate of convergence for non-parametric estimator. We have been able to prove the asymptotic normalities of beta hat and of f hat. And of course, asymptotic normality could be the basis for valid type inference. So simple Gaussian um, asym uh, um, inference. Um, nevertheless, this type of inference, unfortunately, is severely under conservative. So we attempted all of the various uh, corrections that uh, are have been proposed in the literature of non-parametric uh, regression concerning undersmoothing, oversmoothing approaches, uh, bootstrapping, and so on. None of these, in fact, led to very satisfactory results. So more recently, we have been investigating a new line of research, uh, a new uh, non-parametric inference approach, which is a resampling approach based on new resampling ideas. These are not permutation, nor rotation. These are sign flipping of the scores of the model, which have been recently proposed by Hemerick and co-author uh, in a more classical uh, um, regression setting. And this led to powerful uh, um, inference for beta and f. In particular, we have derived test and confidence intervals for beta and f that are asymptotically exact. In fact, those for f are exact, not just asymptotically exact. And they have a very good control of type one error or equivalently, they have very good coverage of the confidence interval, even in a small sample scenario, whereas instead the alternative uh, had very poor control of type one error. 
Okay, so this is very technical, so I should skip this. Now, so far I discuss spatial regression, but the same framework enables you to tackle density estimation or equivalently intensity estimation in these homogeneous Poisson processes. So now the data is a point pattern in the application is the pattern of crimes over the city of Portland. And so each black dot is the location of a crime. And we would like to estimate the underlying density of the point pattern or the underlying intensity of a dishomogeneous Poisson process by respecting the non-trivial form of the domain over which the data are observed. And uh, um, so for instance, you see that, uh, well, downtown, there are many bridges. So here, uh, Portland is divided into parts by the Willamette River. Downtown, you get many bridges, so it's easy to move from one side to the other side of the city. But otherwise, there are few bridges because the uh, river is very wide. In fact, it hosts two arbors. And uh, uh, so the river sort of play a physical barrier to the diffusion of criminality, so to say. And you see, for instance, that here there is a high region of criminality, which is not matched by a high region of criminality on the other side of the river. And so you would like to consider the shape of the domain when you estimate the density of the occurrences or the intensity of the occurrences. So here the data are the uh, realization, while one, while hem, uh, from an unknown density H uh, over T. And I will work in terms of the log density to get rid of the positivity constraint. And uh, we'll estimate F by uh, minimizing, again, a penalized loss function. Well, the penalty is nothing else but the negative log attitude. And the uh, regularization, so the, the, the loss, sorry, is the negative log likelihood. And the penalty is a, a simple isotropic regularization. And uh, now this is a constrained minimization problem because we are working with uh, the density estimation problem. So the function H has to integrate to one of the domain, uh, but uh, constrained minimization is always uh, inconvenient. So you can, can get rid of this constraint by considering this other function, which this additional term, uh, you can approve the equivalence through suitable uh, change of variable. And so probably here you can also appreciate uh, that this is equivalent to a problem in which instead you want to estimate the intensity of a dishomogeneous Poisson process because this is the likelihood that would come out of uh, uh, an inhomogeneous Poisson process. Okay, also in this case, you can prove the well poseness of the estimation problem. And also in this case, you can prove consistency of the estimator in the kullback labler divergence. But since the KL, uh, um, controls also the total variation or the Ellinger, you get the consistency also on the total variation or in the Ellinger. And then of course you discretize the problem, like we were doing for the regression setting. And uh, because of the unstructured uh, basis that we use, you can get a strongly localized mode so you can very well get a multimodal signal with strongly localized and skewed uh, uh, densities. So in this case, for instance, we are again considering criminality over Portland, but these are crimes related to prostitution. And prostitution in Portland happens mostly all, along one road. And the density, as you can see, the density can very well capture this uh, sharp reach uh, of high criminality along the road of prostitution. And likewise, this is an application to the modeling of uh, intensity of earthquake of large magnitude. And again, you can see that the density is uh, uh, very sharp along the folds on the crust. And this can also be space uh, time. Now, um, if we have a few more minutes, just five, I would like to take you for a Conclusion in my own realm. My own realm is that of functional data analysis with application in the life sciences. So I will uh, show you an application of a functional data analysis problem. Um, and in fact, it's an application to neuroimaging data. So imagine for a moment that we have the neuroimaging scanner of <laughs> some of us. Okay. 
And apologies if I didn't do that with you. That's just because I need to wake you up at this point. Uh, so. Uh, so suppose that we have the neural images come uh, in a from a sample or from in a sample from a population, and we would like, for instance, to explore the variability of this data, which in my formalization are functional data observed over multidimensional complicated domains. So here, the domain is the gray matter is a volume uh, non-convex with a formidably complicated structure. And now, PCA principal component analysis turned out to be uh, solvable by a problem alike the one that we discussed so far. So is a problem which we, again, minimize a function which combines a loss. In fact, the loss is a least square loss. So it's a extremely simple loss plus a regularization, which in this case can be the simple Laplace operator. Okay, now. We don't have this kind of ourselves, so uh, I took some publicly available data set, and this is a, a publicly available data set from UCLA, but includes, uh, is nevertheless an interesting population because it includes healthy and schizophrenic subjects. And these subjects, they are busy in a so-called task-based functional magnetic resonance imaging. So as they do the scan, they play, they have to perform a task. This task consists in playing at a video game. So they play at the video game while they do the scan. And the video game consists in inflating a virtual balloon. So the largest the balloon, the highest the reward they are going to get for that balloon. At any time, they may stop inflating the balloon, cashing out the reward for that balloon, and start inflating a new balloon. Now, of course, as in real life, as they inflate the balloon, the balloon may explode. If the balloon explodes for that balloon, no reward is obtained, okay? Now, at the end of the scan, these guys were given the amount of dollar that they had collected, which was typically in the order of a few hundred dollars. So there was quite an active involvement of the subject. Of course, this is a study that they do in the States because in Italy, we wouldn't have the money to do it. But nevertheless, why are we looking at this task? We are looking at this task because schizophrenic subjects, they, have, they are thought to be more risk adverse. So we would like to explore what is going on in their brain as they are busy in a task that involves some risk appraisal and decision making. Okay? Um, in particular, the data that we consider are functional connectivity maps with respect to a region of the brain that is the left anterior cingulate gyrus, which is a key region uh, involved in risk appraisal during decision making and in a uh, loss adversion. So let me point out that today in the neurosciences, best state of the art methods work voxel per voxel. So voxel per voxel, you do your analysis totally uh, regardless of the spatial dependence. And then they normally do some, I mean, the more refined analysis normally do some post-processing phase in which they smooth out the result on the basis of some simple spatial data analysis that relies on Euclidean distance, okay? But of course, there is a growing awareness that if we want to um, advance our still limited knowledge of the brain functioning, we have to include uh, as much as we can of the problem-specific knowledge, including, of course, knowledge about the anatomy of the brain. And in fact, I have to say that uh, um, when we started uh, showing this method to neuroscientists, they got very enthusiastic. And now we have publication which does appear in PLOS One, another one that we are about to submit to Nature. They will reject it right away, but I mean, the court want to submit it there. See, I mean, they like it very much because it's something totally new. So these are the first, second, and third principal component. You get a view inside the uh, volume of the gray matter. And this is a, a view on the top of the cortical surface. And nice thing is that these uh, principal components, they are physiologically interpretable. So this is a study that is conducted together with uh, the Neurological Hospital in Milano, which is the major neurological hospital in Northern Italy. And the first principal component, for instance, display greater variation in the inferior frontal gyrus, which is a region implicated in go, no go task and in risk adversion. The second, again, contrast, contrast the lingual gyrus with the insular cortex. They are both devoted to visual purposes and emotional awareness. So you can get physiological insights, which you cannot get with multivariate PCA. I'll show you in a moment. 
And in fact, if you look at the scores along this principal component of the subject in the data set, then you can very well uh, discriminate with an extremely high accuracy uh, the schizophrenic from the healthy. And this is something that you cannot obtain with multivariate PCA. But even more with multivariate PCA, your PCA would be la like this. And as you can see, this PCA, they don't, they don't tell you anything about the phenomenon. They just pick up noise, okay? So as I said, the library has been implemented uh, uh, with the care of uh, um, enabling computational uh, um, sustainability and efficiency also in the context of massive data sets. And it leverages on uh, um, approaches from numerical linear algebra, stochastic approximation, stochastic optimization, parallelization, of course, and so on. Just to give you an idea, the dimension of the estimation problem I just showed you, uh, for each of the subject, uh, you get a datum which is uh, um, described by a vector with uh, 30,000 uh, entries. Uh, you get about 200 subjects. The system we solve has less than 1% of the entries that are non-zero, and the estimation problem has an execution time that is a fraction of a second. Uh, now, extensive simulation, I didn't show you, but extensive simulation demonstrate the comparative advantages of the proposed method with respect to state-of-the-art techniques whenever competing techniques are available. I hope I could convey that the proposed methods are capable to tackle challenging complex data analysis problem. At least they uh, seal up very promising uh, uh, model in that respect. and may support significant advances in forefront fields of application. This is only possible, of course, thanks to a very strong synergy of approaches from statistics, numerical analysis, scientific computing, um, domain knowledge. So let me thank you for your attention.